Hi, I'm Pastor John from the Baptist Church in the Great Valley in Devon, Pennsylvania. Our scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can guests of the bridegroom fast while he is still with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a, a, a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the pressure of the fermenting wine will, will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. The difference between school and life has been expressed this way. In school, you are taught a lesson and given a test. In life, you are given a test and then taught a lesson. Mm. We are all a product of the times in which we grew up and, and, and the lessons that we have learned from our life experiences. My father grew up during the Great Depression of the 1930s, and his experiences of poverty and food insecurity and of just scraping by instilled certain values in him, values which were common to many people of his generation. He always thought it was very important to have a large vegetable garden. And then the surplus had to be preserved in glass canning jars that were stored on wooden shelves in the basement. He had learned the lesson that it's wise to be self-sufficient. You had to be able to feed your family. And down through the years, I've known of many people from that generation for, for whom a, a large garden is just emotionally satisfying, sort of an insurance policy in case things go bad. Perhaps you have known people who felt compelled that same way. We all have had a variety of experiences in life, both good and, and bad, and at one time or another, I bet we've all said, Oh boy, I'm never going to do that again. Or, I'm never going to be unprepared like I was this time. We're all a part of our culture. We're a part of our history, our, our experiences, and our relationships. Jesus, while truly divine and expressing the guidance of God's Holy Spirit within him, was nevertheless living within a particular historical setting. And he had to teach and preach and minister within that context. In other words, we, we simply can't take the teachings of Jesus from first century Palestine and drop them into the 21st century and expect them to fit perfectly and without interpretation. We need to understand the problems that Jesus was facing and the principles that he was trying to teach. For example, Jesus said you need to pour new wine in fresh wineskins. That was completely appropriate for the first century, but certainly not for ours. I mean, when was the last time you walked into a store and saw hanging wineskins full of fermenting wine? 
We are way beyond wineskin technology. And besides, Jesus wasn't trying to teach us how to make wine, but was addressing the difficulty of changing religious traditions. The historical context that Jesus was living in is particularly important in understanding this morning's scripture passage. Jesus was living in Palestine, occupied by the Roman army and ruled by puppet kings and governors who were tyrants. There would occasionally be revolts by religious zealots that would be crushed with such ferocity that the population lived in fear of their leaders. Um, in this difficult time, a theology and an understanding of God was taught, which, which put simply stated that if you are good, God will bless you. If you are disobedient, God will punish you. I mean, they looked back at their own history and they knew that during the time of the great prophets, the children of Israel were warned again and again that unless they repented and changed their ways, they would be punished. Finally, the Babylonians invaded and marched the Jewish leaders off to Babylon to an exile that lasted many decades. Therefore, they came to the conclusion that if you are righteous, you will be blessed. But if you stray from the straight and the narrow, God will punish you. Now, we need to be clear. Not everyone bought into this way of thinking. Kind of made God sound like a tyrant, just waiting to smack people down for, for slipping up. The writer of the book of Job disagreed with this simple formula, telling the story of a righteous man who suffered for no apparent reason or, or fault on his part. Jesus also disagreed with this simple theology, pointing out that workmen killed in a, a recent construction accident were no worse than anyone else. But these were the times, and this was the spiritual culture that Jesus lived in and ministered in. Israel was suffering, and the common religious understanding that God is punishing us because we are not good enough was what so many people believed. They believe that we really have to look at the law of God under a microscope and we must learn to be obedient to every molecule of God's law. We must split every last hair to ensure God's blessing upon this nation. And there were groups of highly devout and committed people who did their very best to separate themselves from the corruption of, of their day in order to study the law. And they were devoted to teaching the people how to follow the law in the way that they believed God expected in order that they and their country would be blessed. And these people were called the Pharisees, meaning the separated ones. Throughout his ministry, Jesus frequently knocked heads with these religious know-it-alls, some of whom just excelled at being fault finders and hair splitters and nitpickers, who believed that God was compulsively tracking their every violation. Well, Jesus was trying to introduce the people to a loving Father who forgave them and who knew their weaknesses. In today's scripture, Jesus was challenged for not appearing religious enough. Quite simply, Jesus was not as careful with the traditions 
and the rituals as some people believed a religious leader should be. But Jesus was so in touch with God and lived a life of such integrity that when it came to the issues of life and questions regarding the nature of God and, and the worship of God, Jesus was completely comfortable with who he was, even when everyone else told him he was wrong. The issue in today's passage was fasting. In the Jewish religion, they have a, a special day called the Day of Atonement. It's a day of repentance and confession for sins of the past year. And it is a day when as, when as a sign for their repentance, they go without food from sunup to sundown. Of course, working people would... Uh, get up before sunrise and have their breakfast, and then they would have a late dinner after the sun had set, and they would have completely met their religious obligations. So without it being too much of a hardship, it was an effective way to recognize the day, this day that was set aside for repentance and reflection. Now. If fasting was good, one day a year, as Moses had commanded, maybe fasting more than that would be even better. Maybe fasting twice a week would really, really put you in touch with, with, with God and show that you were, were special. In fact, in Jesus' day, the super religious would fast twice a week, on Monday and on Thursday. Now, honestly, there are some good reasons for, for fasting. It's a great way to help you keep your life in perspective. It, it's a way of controlling and having discipline over your impulses, rather than allowing your impulses to have control of you. Fasting or Voluntarily choosing to do without helps us really appreciate the blessings that God has given us when we return to them. Back when I was young, I used to do a bit of, of backpacking. And it was hard work, but it, it took you to places you could never get otherwise. But you know, the best part of backpacking was getting back home again taking a hot shower, washing your hair, being able to put on clean socks. Every little toe would sing with ecstasy. A comfortable bed, being inside out of the rain or the sleet or the snow. Clean, dry clothes, hot meals. It was wonderful. There was an old song we, we used to sing Count your blessings, name them one by one. Well, if you really want to appreciate all of the good things that God has provided, just try doing without some of them for a while. It'll really help to get a new perspective and to be thankful for all that we have. So there are good reasons for, for fasting, but like any good thing, it can be misused. And we learned that uh, there were those who used fasting as a means to try to earn extra status and prestige over the other people of their community. Normally, fasting is a, a private matter but between you and, and God. And there's no reason why anyone would ever know that you were fasting particularly if it's only for, for 12 hours. But people are people. And there were those who would go around looking haggard and disheveled and hungry and who would try to slip it into conversation to, 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 to discreetly let other people know that they were just a little bit more spiritual 
maybe they were just a little closer to God than the others. Obviously, uh, fasting in an attempt to look good to others or, or righteous is, is a long way from true repentance or a true spiritual discipline. It's a long way from what Jesus said about going into your closet privately to pray so that your, your prayers are not for show and what you say is just between you and God. In fact, it's, it's a common theme from, from the prophets of the Old Testament that God isn't particularly interested in public rituals and grand lip service and making a show of our righteousness. The way to really worship God is with our hearts or with secret deeds of kindness. Perhaps it was this abuse of rituals which led Jesus to decide that fasting was not going to be a part of his training of his disciples, at least not at that time. One of the significant hallmarks of Jesus' ministry was his willingness to break away from established religious rituals and, and, and laws in order to liberate his followers to truly worship God from their hearts. Someone asked Jesus about kosher food. Jesus told them kosher food really was not very important. What you eat doesn't make you impure or sinful. It's what goes on in your heart and your mind that really matters. Uh, another time, the, the Pharisees were giving Jesus a hard time about healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus responded that the, the Sabbath was given by God for our benefit. It was a wonderful gift of rest that the people needed. But in Jesus' day, it was no longer seen as a gift, but a responsibility. It had been captured and fenced in with so many rules and regulations that had, it had become a heavy burden for, for people who were always worried if, if they could thread the needle of God's expectations. Have you seen the Geico ad where Sylvia, a, a representative of the Homeowners Association, is just lowering the boom on these new neighbors who have just moved in, hanging baskets of flowers, violation, mailbox two inches over the regulations, saw it down, cardboard in the recycling bin hasn't been broken down properly. <laughs> Some people seem to have that need. They, they need to feel superior and they need to criticize others and how much worse when they think they are serving God by doing so. But Jesus invites us to a brand new reality. Rather than cringing in fear and skulking about as slaves trying to please a cranky master, we are invited through God's love to be adopted as children of the household. We are set free from the guilt of sin and all the religious yardsticks used to measure our worthiness. In the book of Galatians we read, you were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, we are set free to love and to serve in God's name. How much easier it is just to simply keep the rituals. Oh, it's Thursday. Today I fast. 
Uh, church council meets tonight. I better wear my black wingtip shoes. Or they're going to ask me to pray. Perhaps I can find something on the internet that sounds righteous. But instead, Jesus calls us to be real, to surrender our lives to the Lordship of Christ, and to open our lives to the power of the Holy Spirit to joyfully serve and to love others.